guests. I'm honored to open and moderate our third chapter on how to protect Ukrainian and foreign investors from consequences of the Russian aggression in Ukraine. This webinar is hosted by Ukrainian Bar Association's International Law Committee, and it is aimed at helping in-house lawyers at multinational and local companies to understand how international law can help protect their company's rights and interests. And today we will focus on investment arbitration. My esteemed colleagues and I will talk about the prospects of investment arbitration against Russia to collect inflicted damages. We will both cover a set of general questions as well as discuss more specific points like could, uh, positive, could, could the positive practice of Crimean cases be applied uh, in favor of Ukraine right now, as well as how human rights law affects the obligation of arbitral tribunals and national courts. We will also cover the first lessons learned from investment claims arising out of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and we will talk about war clauses in uh, Russian bilateral investment treaties. For all of this, we thank our most welcome speakers, who are Alina Danileko, Olga Kuchmienka, Yulia Atamanova, Lorraine de Germany, and uh, uh, Gordon Nardel, as well as uh, myself. Uh, with that, I suggest we proceed to the opening uh, of our discussion. And uh, here uh, we'll present Ole Kuchmienka, uh, closely followed by Alina Danileko. The Ola is uh, head of uh, a Ukrainian Bar Association's International Law Committee, and she will present on could the positive practice of the previous Crimean cases be applied in favor of Ukrainian of Ukraine now. She will present on territorial aspect while Alina will cover the procedural aspect. Alina is a senior associate at Sayanka Karenka International uh, Arbitration Group. With that, I pass the floor to Olga and Alina. Thank you very much, Vladislav. Hi, everyone. Uh, just uh, to confirm, uh, can everyone see my slides? Thank you. Uh, so, um, my name is Olga Kuchmienko, I am head of the International Law Committee of Ukrainian Bar Association and today I would like to start our uh, discussion with a short introduction on uh, the topic, could the positive practice of the previous Crimean cases be applied in favor of Ukraine now? And I will talk about territorial aspect. My presentation has an aim to mostly to ask questions and to raise them for our discussion then to answer them uh, but uh, i will try to briefly focus on the certain issues like what is crimean cases criteria of effective control over the territory in these cases um, are these criteria are applicable to the newly occupied um, and affected territories donbass zaporizhia and Kherson, and um this event is more than uh, uh, important uh, nowadays since uh, probably everyone know that uh, just um, a few days ago there was another uh, missile attack of uh, Russia in the territory of Ukraine. It was in the territory that is not covered by uh, these uh, few regions, but we see that um, we have to find solutions for uh, the responsibility of Russia more and more. So, uh, what is Crimean cases? Uh, Crimean cases, uh, it's cases of the investors in Crimea in, against Russia after the Russian annexation of Crimea. I mean investment uh, arbitration cases. Uh, this, um, what is special about them? Uh, mostly we are talking about investment arbitration uh, cases that has uh, arisen after 2014. Mostly we talk about Ukrainian investors in Ukrainian Crimea, which was annexated by Russia in uh, 2014. Um, we have to remember that international law does not recognize Crimea as a part of Russian territory as it was acquired illegally. And uh, the concept of effective control was applied to protect the investors under Ukrainian-Russia uh, BAT. Uh, the exhaustive list um, the, of uh, cases uh, probably we can never find for now, but the non-exhaustive one uh, can be found um, 
online. Uh, this presentation will be published later. And um, there were also a couple of recent uh, awards, uh, I mean, uh, set aside uh, in set award, arbitration awards and um, judicial awards in set aside proceedings. And uh, it is, of course, quite hard to find uh, an exhaustive list of criteria that were applied in these cases, but uh, something we can find from these set aside um, decisions. So, for example, the most uh, recent uh, decisions uh, were issued uh, uh, in uh, Aeroport Belbek LLC and Igor Valerievich Kolomoisky versus um, um, Russian Federation and Everest State LLC versus Russian Federation. Um, in both cases, uh, the court um, uh, has rejected uh, numerous objections uh, raised by Russian Federation um, to set aside the award issued by the tribunal. The second uh, mostly relevant case was uh, one of the most relevant cases uh, was um, Ukarnafta versus Russian Federation and Stabil versus Russian Federation. And um, they were also upheld in the Swiss uh, federal court. But uh, when we're talking about effective control, which criteria in international law we are talking about? There are several of them. And this concept was not, was, um, it was, uh, it existed of course in international law, but it was not that common before these uh, cases. And what we are talking about when we talk about um, criteria of effective control, we talk about ability to legislate, like to issue legislation in terms of occupied or controlled territory. We talk about substitution of the state authorities. Um, here we can refer to the DRC versus Uganda ICJ, ICJ case where uh, there was um, said that um, authority shall be in fact established and exercised in the uh, territory in question and uh, that um, the own authority of the um, state shall be um, substituted with a new authority. Um, so certainly it's um, the case, it is criteria on whether Ukraine or any other state has permitted and or objected against other states presence in Crimea, on Donbass or any other territory. So now we are talking about like this criteria in general. So in that uh, DRC versus Uganda case, uh, it was um, the question whether the troops were permitted uh, by, D by DRC. And of course, in our case, Russian troops have never been permitted in any of territory of Ukraine, specifically in Crimean cases. So, um, the, and the last criteria is more or less um, uh, like which approach we are talking about. Is it overall effective control? Or is it uh, just, uh, or it is control in respect to each and every action directly and indirectly. Uh, so um, there are some more demanding approaches from ICJ, for example, like in Bosnia and Herzegovina case versus uh, Serbia and Montenegro, where we are talking about um, control in respect to each action and less demanding approach from uh, ICTY, European Court of Human Rights in other cases where overall effective control, control is enough. So just to make the conclusion on the available criteria of effective control, um, like the most uh, general conclusion that uh, these criteria are flexible, different tribunals uh, take them differently in lawyer and higher thresholds, and uh, the most important thing that actions of the wrongdoer state matter, like Russian state, for example. So if it, um, it acts as the question territory belongs to it, then it's admit, it admits the action and um, basically does the claim and job, in other words. But uh, which criteria of effective control were recognized in Crimean cases? So we can find them based on the uh, published uh, set aside uh, proceed some set aside proceedings, and also we can find them uh, um, in the awards itself. But of course, the awards uh, are not published. Some uh, findings uh, were publicly available, and uh, they are the following. So basically, the criteria are defective control over the territory, practical application of the law 
in Crimea does not depend on the recognition by Ukraine. So regardless um, you, whether Ukraine has admitted uh, the presence of Russia in any of the territory, uh, le legal presence, it does not matter. Then the word territory and BAT uh, covered more than sovereign territory. So that means that uh, it's not important to uh, speak about uh, recognition of this uh, territory and application of these legal mechanisms. And uh, neither state has terminated the BAT. So the BAT is applicable. So these three criteria were considered as um, criteria of effective control to say that Crimea was under it, uh, under Russian effective control. If we talk about uh, whether this criteria of effective control uh, over the territory applicable to uh, Donetsk, Luhansk and um, other regions. So if we talk about um, Donetsk and Luhansk between uh, 2014 and 2022, uh, it might be quite uh, questionable whether we can talk about effective control. We cannot say that it's absolute no, of, of course. It's for a tribunal to decide, but um, in order to prove that between 2014 and 2022, uh, Ukraine should have, um, Ukrainian investors should, should have done um, two-step exercise to prove that uh, not only Ukraine lost the control, but Russia gained it. And uh, secondly, to identify which Russian actions constitute the effective control um, in that uh, territory. And uh, the thing that uh, um, during this period of time, Russia uh, did not, ob Russia ob objected to its present uh, presence in Donbass and uh, the situation has changed only in February 2022, uh, when um, the situation was uh, different. So basically between 2014 and 2022, the uh, proof of this effective control criteria was, um, I think, uh, the, on the hardest threshold. But what has uh, changed in February 2022? Uh, we can start thinking to say that um, Russia took overall effective control, providing general military and financial support of any uh, rebellions uh, in the hmm, uh, in the region or over its uh, troops. So, for example, uh, the situation has uh, changed because Russia has, uh, first of all, issue of boots of the ground um, on this territory, and uh, secondly, uh, that. Um, uh, there were relevant legislation that you can see on the slide that was issued in terms of these territories. Vlad, I, I know that my time almost over, but if I can like have extra like one or two minutes, it will be sufficient. Sure. Um, so basically there were um, certain legislation that you can find um, links on my screen that were issued in terms of, their, of this um, territory, meaning that there was uh, Legislative, le legislative actions over this territory. Does it mean uh, that um, Russia has uh, admitted its, present, uh, its presence there? Probably yes. Does it uh, mean, that, does it sufficient to say that it is effective control? Um, not really, but it is a good start and it was a turning point in 2022. So um, in terms of these territories, we can say that uh, with a good uh, case there, um, can be um, room for discussion in this case. What about the Zaporizhia and Kherson regions? The situation in, in these regions has changed uh, in uh, 2022, and basically these uh, territories were affected by the war um, uh, when the full-scale war started. And um, uh, if, when the entire territory of Ukraine was affected. And in October uh, 2022, Russian federal legislation regarding accepting of Ukrainian Zaporizhia and Kherson, Donetsk and Luhansk as part of Russian Federation were, were issued. Of course, it was illegal. Uh, again, you can find some links uh, to the relevant legislation taken from the Russian um, from their from their Russian legislative um, databases, and uh, you can find uh, the idea that Russia was con was considering this territory as its own, it was legislating, and uh, it, uh, it was thinking about changing the 
uh, ownership of the territory. So uh, what uh, we would like uh, to conclude here, that there are good chances to speak about effective control of Russia over the territory of Donetsk and Lugansk, uh, especially after 2022 20 and the Parisian and Kherson regions, but uh, the a case must be developed in terms of proving not only like the ability of legislate but actual uh, um, but actual uh, actions of the Russia in their territories that the situation was completely different. There were armed troops that were going back and forth, so it is really important to prove. A prove a good case here. Then the date of October the 5th uh, when Russian legislation regarding these re um, regions um, uh, was issued, it can be considered as an evidence, but is not a sufficient evidence to say that. And um, the date uh, uh, when the control has started can be changed drastically in 2022. So uh, potential claimants may think about this strategy and arbitration we will talk with uh, the speakers today whether it's possible but uh, we shall remember that there is no rule of precedent in investment arbitration so this can be a new precedent and secondly tribunal must decide case on case basis of the facts and law applicable to the particular cases whether these criteria are enough whether other criteria shall be applied and um, what we can do so thank you very much i hope i did not exceed my time that much Thank you, Olga. With that, we pass the floor to Alina, who will proceed with procedural aspect. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll just um, share my screen now. <clears throat> Please confirm whether you see uh, the slides. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, um, as as Olga uh, just uh, explained, uh, basically, uh, Ukraine Russia PAD on basis of which the Crimean arbitration initiated by Ukrainian investors against Russia may be initiated. Um, sets out certain boundaries for tribunal's jurisdiction in any potential dispute. Um, as mentioned by you, Olga, the scope of any BAD has territorial, temporal, and uh, uh, substantive aspects. Therefore, for any arbitration to start, uh, it must be established that the claimant is a covered investor within the scope of a certain BAD that the subject matter of the dispute is uh, a uh, covered investment under the respective PAT and that the treaty was in force when the dispute uh, arose, which is uh, referred to as a retiona temporis. Uh, in this brief presentation, I will concentrate on very selective findings of the Crimean tribunals in Crimean arbitrations, uh, of, of the tribunals in Crimean arbitrations in respect of several jurisdictional aspects, which may be of reference for any prospective companies considering the option to arbitrate in connection with the full-scale war. Um, the two main issues which uh, will be addressed uh, uh, is the temporal scope of the BAT as was uh, analyzed by the tribunals in the underlying awards and the procedural predicates for jurisdiction, um, in other words, who can be the investor and what can constitute the, invest the investment. Um, so timing of any claim against Russia is important, as was shown by the Crimean awards. The first issue to address is the uh, temporal scope of the Ukraine-Russia BAT. Um, why this issue is relevant is because the question which the tribunals in the Crimean arbitration assessed first was whether Ukrainian nationals and their businesses existing in Crimea prior to the change of the effective sovereign from Ukraine to Russia may qualify as foreign Ukrainian investors and investments in Russia rather than the domestic ones. Basically, the uh, tribunals explored whether there is a nexus between the time when the investment was initially made and the place uh, where it was commenced. Um, 
the Alina, complication. I, I'm sorry, if I can intervene, yes. I think there is an issue with the video. We can okay. still see only the first slide. I guess you're already on some other slide, right? Uh, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, just restart the PowerPoint. Yes, okay. Thank you. Just a minute. Has anything changed? Not really. Okay. Well, maybe you, you could just uh, change slides inside there, not go into the presentation mode, but stay yes. in the regular mode. Just to click on each slide. Ліна, давайте я спробую запустити, а ви там будете говорити, коли перемикати. Давайте я зараз вже спробую. Зараз видно? Перший слайд. Перший слайд, а зараз? Другий, да. Отак нормально. Все, чудово. Так, дякую, Влад. Окей, so where I was at? About the temp uh, temporal aspect of uh, Crimean arbitrations, why uh, why this uh, is an uh, important aspect and uh, why uh, um, the tribunals actually assess this, as I said, is um, the need to establish whether there is the requirement of nexus between the timing of, of the original investment and the place uh, where this investment is made. Uh, the complication for the tribunals in the Ukrainian cases was that the Ukraine-Russia BAT does not really provide any time frames of coverage of the investments. The only temporal indication is contained in Article 12 of, of the BAT, which refers in the past sense to investments made after uh, 1st January 1992 which was the date of dissolution of the USSR, stating that the treaty would only apply to those investments. However, the Article 12 does not in itself address the issue of the tribunal's jurisdiction as such, but rather it contains a substantive rule on the moment when the substantive protections under the BAT uh, would be extended to a certain investment. And um, whether or not this investment is qualified as such. Um, so, in that sense, um, I will just go to the next slide. It contains the bits of the um, of the relevant findings of uh, the tribunal in um, partial award on uh, in private bank versus Russia case, which was um, uh, published in a redacted uh, form. I will not read uh, them through. However, just to summarize the findings of of the tribunals which, based on, on the documents from various setting aside proceedings, um, appear to be similar to several cases um, in, in the Crimean arbitrations. So major findings of the tribunal in terms of the temporal scope um, may be summarized as follows. First, that assuming that the investment is made within the temporal ambit of, of the Ukraine-Russia BAT, uh, in the meaning of Article 12, that is, the investment was made on or after 1st of January 1992, the date of the initial investment as such will not be controlling for establishing the jurisdiction of the tribunal. Um, the next important finding of the tribunal is that um, the dates on which the tribunal in Crimean case would assess its jurisdiction is the date of the alleged breach and the date on which the claim is brought, which is quite common for the investment arbitration jurisprudence. Uh, and the most important finding of the uh, Crimean tribunals is that um, they found that Ukraine-Russia BAT does not really set any requirements as to the nexus between the time of making the investment and its making in a particular territory. Uh, in the uh, private bank partial award, tribunals also concluded that um, really nothing in the BAT suggests that investment which began as domestic investments 
and later were uh, converted or became international investments should be denied coverage um, only for this for this reason alone. Um, <clears throat> just to keep up with my time. Um, even though Russia uh, has been really no show in the investment arbitrations as such, it has been quite active in uh, the setting aside proceedings in the challenging of, of the underlying Crimean awards. Um, as the result, even though the findings of the Crimean tribunals on the temporal ambit of uh, BAT between Russia and Ukraine appears to be rather logical and straightforward, um, one of the grounds for challenge applied by Russia was that the tribunal does not really have jurisdiction on temporal basis. In setting aside proceedings regarding, for instance, Oshad Bank versus Russia award and Naftogaz versus Russia award, Russia alleged that uh, because the business of the claimants in the Crimean, in the Crimea commenced uh, operations before this cutoff date of 1st January, 1992, the claimant failed to provide evidence that the tribunal has jurisdiction. Um, in Oshadbank uh, setting aside, uh, Oshadbank award setting aside proceedings, the Paris Court of Appeal uh, sought the date on which the banking activity of Oshadbank started in the Crimea, and turned out that the investment of Oshadbank was made before 1991. As the result, the Court of Appeal ruled that. The Ukraine-Russia VAT was therefore inapplicable ratione temporis to Oshad Bank's investment uh, in the Crimea. Um, on 7th December of last year, uh, the uh, French Court of Cassation made a clear distinction in the nature of rules embodied under Article 12 of VAT uh, with the cutoff date and other rules uh, throughout the VAT. Uh, it is interesting and important, uh, I think, for the future prospective arbitrations, um, that the French court clearly established that Article 12 contains a rule of substance. And therefore, even if it, the court itself did not really um, object against the reason or, or reasoning of the tribunal as to its jurisdiction over investment before the cut of day itself, um, it just ruled that because this is a, proceed, a, a substantive rule, uh, the, um, the issue is beyond the judicial scope of review and therefore dismissed the Russia's uh, annulment application on that ground. Um, I also added some bits from the re relevant judgments. This is machine translation um, because, for instance, there is also the interesting uh, ruling of the Hag Court of Appeal uh, in Naftogaz um, or in, in respect of the setting aside proceedings of Naftogaz award, uh, basically where the uh, court takes a completely different uh, approach to, um, to that of the French, stating that because the tribunal actually, uh, because the tribunal did not exclude claims proceeding uh, the year of 1992, um, basically it uh, did not have jurisdiction to uh, consider those cases. And so it basically annulled the uh, award on jurisdiction in part. Um, I'm not sure, okay. So um, turning, to, uh, turning to the uh, next point, um, about the substantive requirements, which is another procedural aspect uh, which has to be considered by prospective uh, claimants, um, it is important to understand that the scope of um, the Russia-Ukraine BAT sets certain boundaries uh, for investment tribunals jurisdiction. And uh, uh, therefore there are certain uh, limitations on what can be included into the subject matter of the Russia-Ukraine BAT. Um, in that sense, the findings of, of the um, Crimean arbitration tribunals as to the investment, of course, do not have the press, uh, res judicata effect for any further uh, arbitrations, but they may be of note 
in for and relevant for understanding of uh, the reasoning and the object of, of purpose of the treaty. In that sense, it's interesting that uh, the tribunals have confirmed that the definition of investment under the Ukraine-Russia VAT uh, uh, is really um, without any constraints. There are no constraints as to the type, but the list of um, investments covered by it is not exhaustive. Um, the, another requirement which was considered in the context of, of what can be considered an investment is the place of, of business, um, which is subject matter of the arbitration. And uh, um, on the CITES, uh, the tribunals ruled that while for the fixed assets, it's more or less clear that the investment takes place in the frame, the location of, of investment is clear. That is that they are situated in the Crimea and other and more complex issue of how to define and assess the status of the um, financial assets, which are subject matter of the claim, because it is more uh, complex. For instance, in the uh, private bank versus Russia case, the tribunal considered the status of private banks loans um, and it defined that the status by the place of the collateral supporting such loans are located in the Crimea. And one of the aspects contributing to defining Crimea as the status of such loans was um, establishing physical inability of private bank to collect such assets. Um, another issue, and that's the issue for the tribunal to be assessed um, in the quantum award, is how to define the status of the deposits, for instance. Um, the legality requirement has uh, two perspectives, whether the um, investment was validly acquired under Ukrainian law and the tribunals assessed this requirement also from perspective, whether there are any limitations on rights to investments. Um, another another um, facet of the, uh, of the subject matter uh, limitations as to jurisdiction of the tribunal is the term of invest investor under the Ukraine-Russia BAT. Basically, uh, the tribunals have established that there are two sub-conditions. First, whether the claimant is an entity properly established under uh, Ukrainian law. And second, whether uh, this claimant may be competent under Ukrainian law to make investments in Russian uh, territory. In um, this context, it is, it is really an open question whether the assessment of the tribunal would be same in respect of assets of which are located in the territory of Donbass, oh, which, for instance, were valid under Ukrainian law before the Russian war, but then the investor, for instance, uh, has become listed uh, as, as in, in the sanctions list or uh, has become subject to of, of certain um, Ukrainian regulatory decisions. Um, so that's an open question whether whether uh, the scope of the Ukraine Russia BAT would expand would extend to the investors subject to a certain regulatory limitations on the Ukrainian law uh, as the result of, of war. Um, so just to wrap up, I don't want to take any more time. Uh, what uh, what ca can be said about the um, what we can take away from these selected procedural findings of the tribunals? Um, first and most important that the BAT of, uh, between Russia and Ukraine covers uh, the investments notwithstanding they predate the conclusion or entering into force of the treaty, um, notwithstanding that such investments may have changed in their basic characteristics and form over time, and notwithstanding that they are maybe held by investors whose nationality or capacity to invest has changed over time. Um, the key issue to consider in this context is um, the extent to which a certain business may be considered as international rather than domestic at the relevant dates. Uh, this decision and assessment has, of course, to be made uh, before uh, initiation of the, of the arbitration. And it is also important considering the findings of the tribunals in Crimean arbitrations, 
on the temporal ambit of the treaty to verify whether a prospective claim would fall um, within such temporal ambit. And that is whether the business, which is subject matter of such claim, uh, was commenced after the cutoff date of 1st January 1992. Um, so that is, that is all on my part. Um, and thank you. Thank you, thank you, Lynn, on that. Uh, so now we proceed to our next section, which is uh, devoted to current prospects of investment arbitrations against Russia concerning damages caused by the war in Ukraine. And uh, before I pass the word to our next speaker, I suggest that due to our technical issues, we just add extra 10 minutes for everyone. So in case you think that your timing is to start at, eight, at 6.30 or 5.30, wherever you are, then it starts at 40, yeah? So everyone can keep track of the time. And this also relates to our audience. We will end precisely or uh, at around uh, 8, 10. Yeah, so at that, I pass the word to Yulia Atamanova, who is the partner at LCF in Ukraine. She's also a member of the uh, International Law Committee, and she will present on war clauses in the Russian BATs. Uh, thank you, Vladislav. Um, good evening to everyone. Uh, now I would ask uh, Victoria to share my slides uh, to start the discussion of this uh, topic that Vlad uh, told. Uh, and uh, it, uh, reverse, uh, it refers to the war clause and uh, whether um, there is any route for application it uh, for the matter of compensation for damages. And um, I would like to stress that all Crimea cases my colleagues told about uh, just earlier relate to such breach of the investor's rights as expropriation of the investments. Uh, Russia annexed the Crimea Peninsula without hostilities, destructions of civil objects, uh, residential areas, uh, infrastructure, and in the scale of damages, uh, events of 2014 and uh, 2022, 2023 uh, are completely different. Uh, during the military aggression of the Russian Federation, uh, Ukrainian and foreign investors suffered different types of laws. Uh, and I would like to define them on several uh, categories. Uh, first of all, uh, and it is quite a separate type of laws, uh, it is a loss of control over the assets on the territories of the Donetsk and Lugansk National Republics uh, since 2014. Uh, and I would like to distinguish this uh, type of laws because uh, during uh, this time, uh, till uh, by the uh, end uh, September, these territories uh, was uh, uh, were not uh, under the legal control uh, sovereignty uh, of the Russian Federation. And it's why uh, there is a point, important point, uh, whether uh, the effective control of the Russian Federation uh, could be established. Uh, the next types uh, of damages uh, refer to the current situation. And uh, I would determine uh, such uh, types as, first of all, destructions, a lot of destructions of assets caused by the military tax. And I guess that uh, uh, they were the first damages uh, we could discuss. Uh, then uh, many uh, of our clients and businesses uh, suffered from loot and pillage of movable assets uh, by military Russian forces and civilians. Uh, then uh, some uh, of uh, businesses just left uh, and stopped providing businesses uh, business activity on the occupied territories um, that uh, have been uh, under the Russian control uh, just because they refuse to uh, to do business uh, in the Russian occupied territories and so uh, there is a denial or loss of access uh, and control over the assets uh, since 24th February 2022 uh, sometimes Sometimes uh, just um, employees uh, have left uh, their homes and uh, no one can even check and control to manage uh, with uh, the assets and business uh, on the place. 
Uh, and uh, the last uh, major types uh, of uh, laws uh, are determined as nas national uh, nationalization, expropriation, or other form of changing ownership without consent of Ukrainian owners. And um, it is not rare when Russia sets up a new state entity and transfer the ownership uh, to it uh, from the Ukrainian ownership. Uh, for example, as uh, Olga mentioned, the Parisian nuclear power station. Uh, and it is not the uh, only example. There, there are lots of them. Uh, so the issue as whether there is a basis for arbitration for compensation losses caused by damaged property, uh, looting goods, lost profits, so on. In other words, for compensation for the uh, war destructions rather than only expropriation. Uh, the next slide, uh, please. And uh, just to share the general log logic, I would like to draw your attention to the key elements that are needed to be set up for commencement of investment arbitration uh, in this regard. Uh, first of all, there are uh, investment, uh, international investment treaty. Uh, we need to determine uh, which uh, investment treaty uh, we will take for further um, exploring. Uh, for example, it might be bilateral uh, investment treaty, uh, like uh, my colleagues discussed Ukraine-Russia BAT, or multilateral invest, uh, international treaty. Uh, I, would, uh, I will uh, speak about it uh, later. Uh, then uh, we could uh, we need to check the qualified investments under the uh, international investment uh, treaty uh, whether uh, the investment uh, is under the protection under this uh, treaty uh, its conformity with the temporal territorial requirements and so on. Uh, then we need to determine uh, the breach of substantive obligations under the uh, treaty. And uh, in this uh, section, we will discuss uh, such obligation as uh, full protection and security. Uh, first of all, that the uh, hosting country of uh, investment uh, ob uh, obliged uh, to provide for. And uh, then we need to determine the remedy, the relevant remedy uh, for this breach and whether the, uh, we could discuss the right for compensation or not. And uh, I would stress uh, one uh, more key element, key point uh, for uh, investment arbitration against Russia, uh, from which uh, Olga uh, started this webinar is, next slide please, is establishment of legal effective control over the territory. And uh, in, uh, in this regard, we should uh, divide uh, the whole period from the February uh, 2022 uh, till now uh, to two uh, large periods. First of all, from the beginning of, uh, from the late February uh, until the late September, uh, early October 2022, when um, Russian the Russian Federation announced uh, the annexation of Donetsk, Kherson, Lugansk, and Zaporizhia uh, regions, and uh, joined them to the Russian Federation. So uh, the time when the sovereignty of the Russian Federation uh, was uh, set up uh, over these territories, uh, and. Um, in the destruction uh, happened on the occupied territory and was caused by the missiles attacks of Russian forces with evidence of that. That potentially might be the claim. Uh, however, there is no similar arbitration case to which the Russian Federation was the responding party on the contrary to the expropriation of Crimean case, related cases, as I told uh, before. Uh, and uh, there is uh, an arguable issue uh, whether uh, there might be uh, the claim uh, if the attack or destruction was caused by the uh, 
counterattacks of the Ukrainian forces. But uh, in this case, I think there is uh, a basis for discussion uh, because it is obvious that the primary cause of uh, all destructions and all what is happening in Ukraine is the invasion of the uh, Russian Federation. Um, the obligations of BATs are not considered uh, to be suspended in times of war. Even more, investment uh, treaties provide for additional protections uh, in times of war and civil strife uh, through the obligation of uh, full protection and security and war closes. And I uh, really, uh, from the beginning of the war, I uh, was interesting uh, whether we could find uh, such uh, provisions um, in the Ukraine, Ukraine, Russian Federation BAT uh, walkable. Um, next slide, please. Um, uh, and um, it is clear that I started my research from the uh, Russian Federation Ukraine BAT, and you can see two main articles uh, in this regard. Article 2 uh, that uh, sets up uh, that each contracting party shall guarantee in conformity with its legislation the complete and unconditional legal protection of investments uh, of investors of the other contracting party. And I would draw your attention that in comparison to, uh, to provisions um, uh, in other uh, BATs uh, with participation of Russian Federation, uh, this uh, provision uh, has a, a reference to the domestic law, and I'm sure that uh, it will be arguable uh, whether the protection uh, should be made in conformity with the Russian legislation or the guarantee. Uh, should be made uh, in conformity with it. And uh, the uh, word legal protection, uh, whether uh, it covers uh, physical protection or not, or, or uh, it is just some kind of limited protection. And the work clause in the Russian-Ukrainian BAT uh, sounds as uh, that uh, the investors of one contracting party uh, whose investment suffered damage on the territory of the another contracting party as a result of war, civil disturbance, or other similar circumstances shall be granted uh, a regime no less favorable than the one with the letter contracting parties granting to investors of any thought state with respect to any measures uh, which is undertakes in connection with such damage. Uh, so uh, the, um, regarding the protection from war strife, uh, there is no the um, standard uh, of uh, remedy. Uh, there is uh, it is set up only uh, the uh, right for compensation on the basis of uh, most favorable nation regime only. Uh, no uh, right to uh, absolute right to compensation in certain circumstances uh, under this uh, BAT. Uh, so uh, just alone, it is a question whether uh, we can apply uh, for these uh, work clues to get the compensation or not. And just uh, for comparison, uh, I would uh, like to show you uh, that uh, this approach to the war uh, clues um, is quite general for the uh, BATs with the participation of the Russian Federation. I checked uh, several, uh, not all of course, but many uh, BATs with participation of Russia, and uh, all of them um, doesn't provide for any exact right for compensation for damages uh, as a result of a war. Uh, so uh, usually uh, it is established only uh, 
this most favorable nation regime uh, for compensation of war damage or uh, national uh, treatment regime. Uh, for example, I uh, have uh, two examples in my presentation. Next slide, please. Um, for example, uh, in the BAT with uh, the United Kingdom, uh, there is a standard uh, full protection and security provision um, nothing special and um, it is uh, um, established um, a most favorable national regime only uh, again uh, for compensation for damages uh, caused by the armed conflict uh, or uh, civil disturbance. Uh, this, the next slide, please. Uh, the uh, one more BAT uh, provisions uh, from it uh, is uh, the uh, BAT with uh, the United States. And uh, again, full protection and security uh, provision um, is as a standard and uh, we can uh, see some kind of extended war uh, clause in this BAT uh, because it covers not only a uh, most favorable nation regime but a uh, national treatment regime as well uh, with the words shall be uh, com accorded non-discriminatory treated by such other party as regards restitution, indemnification, compensation, or any other measures it adopts in relation to such losses. And I would like to uh, discuss uh, the case uh, which provisions uh, both of these uh, duties of the hosting party or uh, hosting country um, full protection and security clause and work clause um, uh, were considered by the tribunal in one of the uh, investment arbitration cases. Next slide, please. Um, um, I mean uh, the case uh, Asian agricultural products uh, against Republic of Sri Lanka, uh, which were uh, sold by the uh, seed. And uh, in this case, the tribunal granted a compensation for loss incurred by the governmental forces uh, to the shrimp farm uh, due to the allegation of a stay in the some rebuttal troops. And the claimant referred, uh, referred to two articles of the UK Sri Lanka uh, BAT, uh, full protection and security, and loss, uh, losses sustained due to in insurrection. Um, and uh, the tribunal dismissed the application uh, of Article 2, so full protection and security uh, clause, and uh, found that this standard could not be interpreted as creating strict liability of the hosting party uh, without the uh, without. Uh, uh, not without, uh, it found that it is, uh, it should be proved that the damages suffered uh, were attributable to the state or its agents and to establish a uh, state's responsibility for non-acting uh, acting with a due diligence, diligence, but the claimant didn't provide uh, the tribunal with such a uh, kind of evidence. And the tribunal held uh, that article uh, the four uh, about losses sustained due to the uh, to an insurrection was applicable in this case. But the difficulty was that article four only provided for compensation to be paid on no less favorable terms than the host state accorded to its own nations or nations of a third state. And the article uh, didn't uh, include any substantive standard of of compensation. Uh, so it is quite clear uh, what we were talking about uh, regarding the uh, Russian-Ukrainian BAT. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, as I uh, told before, uh, the tribunal granted, uh, granted the compensation, uh, but on the basis of generally accepted rule of international law, not giving them the names. And uh, I um, 
uh, decided to cite uh, to make a citation of the award, uh, Para 72, uh, where uh, you can find the main conclusions uh, of the tribunal. Uh, first of all, uh, I stress that uh, the tribunal granted the decision only on the bas basis of generally accepted rule of international law uh, without explanation which one. And uh, it uh, came to the decisions that a state on whose territory an insurrection occurs is not responsible for loss or damage sustained by foreign investors unless it can be shown uh, that the government of the state failed to provide the standard of protection required by treaty or under general customer law. And failure to provide the standard of protection required entails the state's international responsibility for losses suffered, regardless of whether the damage occurred uh, during the insurgents of uh, offensive act or resulting from governmental counter insurgency activities. Uh, so, uh, I guess this case might be very helpful for us to develop, uh, to advance uh, the, situ the uh, real problems uh, of the uh, Ukrainian investors and foreign investors uh, regarding destructions uh, caused on the occupied territories. And uh, I would uh, go to another approach, uh, which I think might be helpful uh, uh, on this topic, uh, and uh, to, con to consider and to show that uh, the another standard of war clause uh, exists, uh, and it refers, it uh, provided for by the Energy Chapter Treaty. The next slide, please. Yeah, uh, first question uh, which uh, arose in the mind of everyone is that uh, the Russian Federation in, is not a member of the uh, Energy Chapter Treaty, uh, but I would like to stress that uh, this uh, treaty might be, uh, is applicable to Russia and uh, to determine uh, the reasons uh, that is, first of all, the Russian Federation signed the ECT but did not ratify it, yes, but uh, and only agreed to provisional application of its terms, uh, although even this agreement uh, was terminated on 19 October 20, uh, 2009. But parts uh, three and five with respect to any investments made in the area uh, during such provisional application shall nevertheless remain in effect with respect to those investments for 20 years following the effect, uh, effective date of termination. Uh, consequently, the ECT provides that investments made in Russia continue to benefit from ECT protection for 20 years following the termination in 2009. Uh, see, this means that for the protection of investments made before 19 October 2009, investors may bring claims against Russia under the ECT until 19 October 2029. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, the um, as exact uh, interest uh, of uh, my, my interest uh, to this treaty was uh, caused by the specific work clause provided by it. Uh, and first of all, um, it uh, envisaged uh, it is envisaged uh, by Article Twelve, and the uh, first part, a uh, first uh, paragraph of this article. Uh, again prescribes just the uh, application uh, for compensation for uh, loss caused by war or other armed conflict uh, on the uh, most favorable uh, nation regime. Uh, but uh, the second part is much more helpful for us. Uh, please, the next slide. Uh, and uh, it provides uh, the uh, different situations and the uh, 
absolute right for compensation, uh, which uh, shall be prompt, adequate, and effective. And uh, you can see that uh, the laws that is prescribed uh, for by this uh, PARA uh, covers uh, requisition, uh, of its uh, of the investment or part thereof uh, by the letters forces or authorities uh, or destruction of its investment uh, or part thereof um, by the letters forces or authorities uh, so uh, this uh, article uh, prescribes the exact right uh, of the applic uh, of the investors uh, for compensation uh, for damages uh, for this, uh, caused by destructions of property. Uh, really, uh, uh, I have not found any case, relevant case, uh, of application uh, of this article. Uh, how about just the uh, news uh, appeared in the late December uh, 2022 that America, uh, Armenian hydropower investors have notified uh, Azerbaijan uh, of potential energy chapter treaty claim worth hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, described uh, as the first known investor state disputes arising out of the second Nagorno-Karabakh war uh, of 2020. And uh this um, claim uh, refers uh, and based uh, on uh, Article 12 of the ECT. Um, the problem uh, with a potential and I guess the main problem with uh, the application of the ECT for uh, compensation uh, for damages uh, would be uh, regarding the uh, territorial jurisdiction of the uh, tribunal. And please uh, share the next slide. Uh, and the problem uh, uh, refers to the uh, determination of the area uh, under this uh, treaty, because it um, not only refer to the territory as itself, but the territory under the sovereignty of the uh, country, contracting party. So the standard of proof uh, of the uh, territorial requirement uh, for jurisdiction of the tribunal will be higher than just to show the uh, physical control uh, over the territory uh, by the Russian Federation. I guess that uh, the because of this uh, provision uh, of the treaty, uh, we can discuss uh, the uh, potential claim after the referendums were held uh, on the occupied territory by the Russian Federation. But uh, it might be more difficult uh, than in a Crimean case to determine the control. Uh, that's why the jurisdiction of the tribunal uh, regarding the situations uh, which uh, took place before these dates. And uh, the next slide, the last two slide, slides, just several words about the uh, potential uh, arbitrations uh, and the applicable law um, for uh, solving the um, cl claims uh, under the uh, ECT. Uh, and Article 26 uh, determines uh, the cool period of three months uh, for example, in comparison to six months under the Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine, uh, Russian, uh, Russia BAT. And uh, the next slide, please. And uh, there are several options for the jurisdictional institutions. First of all, uh, the investor might choose between the uh, exceed uh, to choose a sole arbitrator or a talk arbitration tribunal established under the ancestral arbitration rules. And uh, the uh, last option is uh, to choose the Arbitration Institute, Institute of the Stockholm uh, Chamber of Commerce. And uh, what uh, is quite um, 
interesting and uh, I guess uh, might give a wider uh, uh, wider approaches uh, for wider basis for these uh, claims uh, is the applicable law. The last slide, please. Not the last, the next one. Um, the um, applicable law under the ECT is not some uh, domestic national law of the uh, hosting party of the uh, investment, but uh, all, uh, all disputes uh, should be decided uh, in accordance with this treaty and the applicable rules and principles of international law. And I guess uh, this might be the good ground for uh, wider arguments uh, uh, in favor of uh, Ukrainian and uh, foreign investors, uh, why uh, they have uh, the right uh, to, uh, to get compensation for damages uh, on the occupied territories, and even uh, for uh, explanation of the uh, effective control over the territories before the referendum, and some uh, and uh, this approach uh, of application of international law uh, was uh, supported uh, in the uh, in Yuka's case uh, that was provided under the ACT, and the tribunal found that applicable sus substantive law to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties and other applicable rules and principles of, of international law. So uh, today I just wanted to uh, raise uh, some kind of new, uh, new uh, issue, new aspect of potential uh, investment arbitration uh, against Russian Federation uh, regarding not only expropriation, but uh, how to uh, to uh, to ground how to to ground how uh, to find the basis for the compensation of other types uh, of losses uh, as uh, destructions, uh, looting of uh, movable assets, and other types of loss. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Julia, and. Uh... Now we will pass the floor to Lorraine de Germany, and she is a partner at LALIF. She will speak to us about investment claims arising out of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the first lessons that we already learned, and uh, that UN resolution recommendation on the creation of a register of damages. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. I'm certainly delighted and honored to, to be with you here today and uh, to share thoughts on, on yeah, further thoughts on, on the possible investment claims arising out of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and how and where they could be brought. Um, there have, of course, been various claims uh, we've read about in the news filed against Russia uh, or Russian state-owned entities since the invasion but these relate to harm incurred outside of Ukraine and claims arising outside of Ukraine. Um, I'm thinking of the claims filed by the German energy companies RWE and Uniper against Gazprom as a result of Gazprom's halting of the supply of gas, a move of course understood to be retaliation against the West's support of Ukraine and seeking to put pressure on the West. Um, those claims were announced in late November, early December, um, so we'll, we'll be following that. And there are, of course, um, also reports of possible claims against Russia and or state-owned entities arising out of acts and omissions in Russia, not Ukraine. Um, so in other words, uh, situations of forced exits and expropriations of foreign investors with investments in Russia uh, and deemed to be from unfriendly countries. In that regard, um, I've, I'm also aware that the Russian finance ministry has recently proposed that foreign investors from the so-called unfriendly countries, if, divest, if divesting, will have to sell assets at a discount of at least 50% and give a 10% contribution to the state budget. And of course, Belarus has also passed or is passing decrees similar to what 
the Russian government is announcing. As far as I'm aware, though, there have been no investment claims filed by either Ukrainian investors or foreign investors in Ukraine against Russia for harm incurred in Ukraine as a result of the 2022 Russian invasion. And I'm also not aware of any claims having been filed by foreign investors against Ukraine as a result of the war. Um, there are, of course, um, and we've heard about the types of damage, uh, especially from Yulia just now, um, but of course there are all sorts of reports in the news about various foreign investors in Ukraine that have been affected, that are being affected, uh, port terminals in Nikolaev, where, uh, you know, there was a fire following a Russian missile attack, um, certain plants in, that are no longer operating or factories that have shut down, and also um, storage facilities in the Black Sea area uh, attacked by Russian missiles. So there are all sorts of different um, investors affected in different places and in different ways. And that raises questions as to how, how this can be handled going forward. Now, um, when we talk about investment claims arising out of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the first question that we don't want to hear, but is there a risk of Ukraine being hit with investment claims by foreign investors? And I just want to touch upon that briefly. Um, Ukraine is, of course, a party to many BITs. And needless to say that um, you know, a foreign investor would have difficulty filing an FET claim or full protection and security claim against Ukraine for losses suffered as a result of the Russian invasion. Um, Ukraine would have defenses to the effect that times of war, it was not able to provide the protection to foreign investors to which it had committed under a particular BIT. There are, though, these war clauses that we've mentioned that Yulia was also just discussing um, in the context of Russian BITs. But there again, uh, Ukraine also has a number of um, such war clauses. Um, and some such clauses have been used by investors as an independent basis for compensation. Um, so, you know, Ukraine has, has war clauses that are framed in different ways, and a number of them are indeed clauses that say, that are, that are effectively basic war clauses that are saying, you know, Ukraine, if you compensate Ukrainian investors for harm, um, caused during this war, you have to also compensate foreign investors. You can't discriminate. Um, I, won't, I won't stay longer on that, but it's just something to be aware of because um, these war clauses are there and uh, some are more extended uh, than simply going, than being limited to questions of discrimination. But of course, the real question that we're discussing today is can investment claims be brought against Russia? for harm to both Ukrainian and foreign investments in Ukraine, and if so, how? So uh, yes, Russia is a party to many BITs, 63 are currently in force. So in theory, those BITs can be invoked. That being said, um, I'm aware that there has been a bill recently introduced uh, in the Russian parliament uh, proposing to terminate BITs with the so-called unfriendly states. And that bill, I understand, will be submitted to the Duma in the spring. In any event, these BITs would have um, sunset clauses and would still survive some time. But it's something to be aware of. That being said, given the magnitude of the conflict and the losses, it seems clear that um, reparations will not all be dealt with through individual investment claims and suits. Um, and that brings me to the UN General Assembly resolution. And many of you may, may have heard about it. It was adopted on November 14th, and it's entitled Furtherance of Remedy and Reparation for Aggression Against Ukraine. And the resolution, and I'll just quote some language for those of you who, who haven't seen it. Uh, the resolution recognized that the Russian Federation must be held to account for any violations of international law in or against Ukraine, 
and that it must bear the legal consequences of all of its internationally wrongful acts, including making reparation for the injury, including any damage caused by such acts. So the resolution does not only address violations of international humanitarian law, it addresses any violations of international law in Ukraine, which could include violations of international law that harm foreign investors in Ukraine, right? So not just Ukrainians. Um, and the resolution also recommended the creation by member states in cooperation with Ukraine of an international register of damage to serve as a record in documentary form of evidence and claims information on damages and loss and injury. Uh, the resolution was adopted with 94 votes in favor and 14 votes uh, against it. And uh, there were a number of, of abstentions as well. So the exact parameters and modalities of this possible claims com commission um, are remain entirely to be defined and it's likely to take some time. So we have to see how this will develop. Um, but of course, various commentators are, are, are comparing and recalling that following Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in 1990, the Claims Compensation Commission was established by the UN. And just, for, just to recall the sort of parameters of that commission, um, it accepted claims of individuals, corporations, and governments. It received approximately 2.69 million claims, seeking a total of approximately $352.5 billion in compensation. And 1.5 million claims, so out of 2.69 million claims, were awarded, and a total of $52 billion. Uh, nearly 100 governments submitted claims for their nationals. And there were different categories of claims that people could bring that included a fixed sum amount for individuals or companies that had to leave Kuwait or Iraq during the invasion, uh, claims for serious personal injury and or death of an immediate family member, um, and claims then were also categorized by whether they were for more or less than $100,000, depending on the losses. Now, even if this UN initiative is ongoing, if you are a foreign investor in Ukraine, or if you're a Ukrainian investor in Ukraine, and you've suffered losses as a result of the Russian invasion, you should certainly seek legal advice <laughs> and not, not wait. Um, if you have a contract with a Russian party, whether it's a private party or a state-owned entity, you may be able to, of course, bring some sort of breach of contract claim in, a, in some forum. And even if you don't have a contract with a Russian state-owned entity or the Russian state, you may be able to bring investment claims against Russia. And counsel with experience in international investment law can advise you as to your possible claims and what you should be doing in any event right now to try to preserve and document your claims, since, of course, um, every day the situation is changing. So it's, it's hard to know how to act, but there are things you can be doing um, to keep records. And of course, as we've heard today, um, one of the possible doctrines that could be invoked to allow claims by foreign investors or Ukrainians against Russia for harm done in Ukraine is that of effective control. That's really um, perhaps the key doctrine. So if Russia has asserted and has control over a certain area of Ukraine, and you are an investor in that area that has suffered losses as a result of the invasion, you might have, you might already in theory have claims against Russia. This is because Russia cannot have, as we say, can't have its cake and eat it too. It can't on the one hand assert or have control over a given area. And then for purposes of a lawsuit and arbitration, claim that the territory is not Russian and that the tribunal doesn't have jurisdiction and that's not responsible for, for the harm at issue. Um, what is somewhat different, um, just to reiterate what we've heard, I think, is that somewhat different from the Crimean cases is that there Russia had undisputed control of a certain area in question. Um, Russians came in, they applied Russian law, set up Russian administration and courts, 
uh, put in the ruble. And that is, of course, not the situation with the various areas of Russia right now that we, we, we've been talking about. To be perfectly clear, though, and I think this has, I think this is understood from the presentations we've heard, the notion of effective control is very different from the notion of sovereignty, right? Um, a tribunal, we're not talking about when I say that control um, of Crimea was undisputed, that's not to say, of course, that it was undisputed from an international law point of view uh, or from a Ukrainian point of view. When we talk about effective control, um, a tribunal need not find that Russia's asserted control of a certain area or asserted sovereignty, um, it doesn't have to find that that assertion is recognized by Ukraine or that it's in accordance with international law. Um, and then we must also think about separately the, the situation if you're there again, a foreign investor or Ukrainian investor that has suffered losses in an area of Ukraine that is not under the control or arguably under the control or effective control of Russia. Um, that's, of course, going to be an entirely separate question. Um, and it will likely be more difficult to bring a claim against Russia under the current investment treaty framework. And that may be right. Another reason why the UN, um, the UN General Assembly uh, resolution and, and possible claims commission is, is especially important because, of course, there's been harm well beyond the areas of Donetsk and Luhansk and so forth. Um, and finally, just a few words, which we haven't talked about yet, but it's just on enforcement. Um, you know, we behind all of this is well, how what what really is what really is the plan? How can we seize uh, Russian assets? And for those of you who who may not have been following it, there is sort of a big divide right now in terms of the EU and the U.S. perspectives. Um, the EU is pushing to unfreeze uh, frozen Russian funds um, and basically seeking to expropriate them to com compensate Ukrainian parties. Um, so uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen recently announced that they had blocked 300, 300 billion euros of the Russian central bank reserves and frozen 19 billion euros of Russian oligarchs money. And you know has stated quite clearly that the the goal is to use that money to compensate Ukrainians and to reconstruct the country. The U.S. though is much more reserved <laughs> in its approach on this question. And uh, from a legal point of view, the Department of Justice has also announced uh, the freezing of assets in the U.S. and also um, of Russian oligarch assets. But it is saying you can freeze, but you can't legally dispossess them of these funds. You need evidence of criminality. Um, uh, so they, they are, that's the position right now. I'll stop there um, and look forward to, to continuing the discussion. Thank you, Lorraine. At that, I will tap on the stage, share my screen. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Excellent. Then, uh, good evening once again to everyone, especially to those who just joined uh, or joined just uh, uh, with slight delay. Uh, my name is Vladislav Vondrovsky and uh, uh, I will present on how to prepare before commencing investment arbitra arbitration against Russia for uh, invasion cost damages. Uh, with these slides, uh, I aim to provide with you with a checklist of things to do and evidence to collect uh, for investment arbitration against Russia. And uh, this is uh, my uh, shorter brief answer, like a helicopter view answer to those uh, in-house lawyers asking like, okay, if uh, tomorrow we decide to go uh, for investment arbitration, what should we do? What should we be prepared to do? Is there something that we can do already in advance? So uh, how to preliminary assess whether your claim can be brought before an investment arbitration tribunal? 
although not a guarantee of success, before commencement of an investment arbitration, UKs uh, should satisfy at least the following criteria. First of them is that the state where the owner of the investment is based should have an international investment treaty with Russia, which provides for investment arbitration. Ukraine and Russia, for example, have such treaty signed in 1998. It's a bilateral investment treaty and it provides for uh, Stockholm Chamber of Commerce arbitration or the ancestral arbitration. Uh, the list of the countries that have uh, investment uh, treaties with Russia uh, can be found on the investment policy in that website. Second, uh, what you have lost must qualify as an investment. Uh, this has already been covered by my colleagues, but briefly for the purposes uh, of Russia war against Ukraine, Invest investments uh, would often include movable and immovable property, deposits or participations, rights to perform commercial activity and develop and exploit natural resources. Thus, for example, a factory or a plant or a mill would likely amount to an investment. Uh, a right to use an agricultural land to grow crops and uh, would also amount to an investment. Uh, while movable and immovable property uh, is a slightly more uh, muddy and question, questionable area. Third, the investment must have been located and damaged uh, uh, on exp or expropriated uh, on the territory de facto controlled by Russia. It is not enough that Russia has bombed your business from a distance, as it happened, for example, to more western parts of Ukraine. Uh, on the current state of law, you can only recover from Russia if it has damaged or expropriated your investments uh, with, while it had de facto controlled the territory where it was located. Uh, so whether we should write to Russia to start the cooling off period. Uh, at this point, it may be a bit premature to commence the arbitration and the, and, uh, the preemptive uh, cooling off period. But for the sake of clarity, one must know that before proceeding to arbitration, it will be necessary to ask your lawyers uh, to write to Russia and to notify them uh, of your claim. Uh, for example, under Article 9 of the Russia-Ukraine BAT, an investor is obliged to notify its claim to Russia accompanied with detailed comments. The parties have six months to resolve their dispute prior to it being referred to arbitration directly. It may be possible to commence arbitration prior to the expiration of the six month period. However, it may then lead to lengthy discussions with the tribunal or Russia, should it decide to participate in the proceedings as to why did the party, as to why the party didn't try to negotiate and comply with the requirement under the investment treaty. Uh, in the worst case scenario, a failure to satisfy the condition could even result in the dismissal of the investment claim. Uh, in any event, uh, uh, one probably should not initiate uh, arbitration and things and uh, the cooling off period uh, before collecting evidence. So the next step is collecting evidence and investor would need to demonstrate that the investment was located and damaged on the territory de facto controlled by Russia. And uh, here is what can be done in this regard. So at first go to the Institute for the Study of War, Ukrainian maps uh, and uh, save the maps uh, which show when Russia forces occupied your business location. In this uh, territory, what, if, if this territory was uh, uh, later recaptured uh, by Ukraine, uh, you should identify the date when it was recaptured and uh, save the maps until the date. It's also uh, advisable to uh, interpose the Google Maps with the location of your business uh, and the War Institute Maps. There are also other reliable sources of information that you could use, uh, but uh, at least this uh, would be a good, a, a good beginning. Next, uh, you should find press articles or video news um, show, showing or discussing uh, when Russian forces uh, uh, occupied the relevant territory and what uh, harm did they do there? If they have been mar uh, marauding, stealing, or destroying property, and uh, uh, this this evidence of this might be helpful for your arbitration. Uh, also, find evidence of uh, appointing governors or uh, administration in 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 the region. Uh, it happened to, to several areas already now. 
Uh, also check if they demanded that local business registered with the local uh, uh, self-proclaimed authority or Russian authority and required to pay taxes. Uh, you may also extend your search and find whether other uh, relevant or similar uh, regulations were issued. Or even uh, you could check if the Russian appointed administration passed some kind of law or legal regulation. Uh, importantly, uh, for all of these, uh, find as many uh, official reports, uh, sources, evidence, uh, documents uh, as you can. Uh, establish dates uh, of all events uh, that happen to your business. Another often overlooked uh, advice is to initiate criminal investigation here in Ukraine and uh, actively support and guide uh, the criminal investigators. Uh, criminal investigators have a much broader arsenal for collecting and documenting evidence, uh, so they can help you preparing schemes of rocket attacks uh, and uh, collect uh, tail numbers of those uh, rockets, uh, which would later help you to establish the causal link with the cause damage. Uh, you can also uh, you can also uh, ask the investigators to engage and interview witnesses and request them to ask uh, uh, military administrations and uh, 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 army formations uh, uh, at the relevant territory to uh, to to uh, confirm that certain Russian units uh, were. Uh, were actively engaging in uh, uh, war crimes or just in uh, uh, damaging property at certain area. Uh, also, uh, in some cases, it's even possible uh, to actually receive a paper certifying that uh, it, that, that, that according to the uh, arm, Ukrainian army's opinion, uh, the damage was caused by a certain Russian uh, military unit. Uh, that could be helpful at the later stages. Uh, basically, many of these things can be done even without criminal investigation. Uh, while with the criminal investigation, that would have more weight and uh, uh, it would be like accompan accompanied kind of with uh, an official authority. And these findings will be more uh, persuasive. Uh, a positive thing here is that even if you decide not to proceed with the investment arbitration, but uh, uh, go for some other procedures, uh, uh, it is very likely that the evidence that you will collect in this uh, in this way will will be still helpful. Okay, so uh, as the claimant in investment arbitration proceedings. You would need to explain in respect of which investment you are seeking compensation, what rights you had to this investment, and uh, what uh, actually happened to your investment. Uh, claiming for the loss of medium or large, large business, uh, you could either claim for the cost of the property and equipment, or ideally you would claim for the loss of the whole business uh, as, as such. As to the property, you would have to prove your rights and uh, identify the market value of the property prior to the Russian occupation. Uh, at the same time, if you want to claim the value of the business, you would need to adduce expert evidence demonstrating such value. There are uh, auditing firms and uh, also uh, advisory firms and uh, firms that specialize in damages. Uh, they would have uh, uh, to prepare a report uh, calculating the value of the business uh, in view of uh, its potential earnings and uh, other factors. A uh, practical point here would be to consider that an expert report uh, and uh, expert, expert's time uh, will mostly be quite expensive. So in case uh, the um, in potential investor is thinking of uh, claiming damages for small business, uh, it might be uh, it might be economically efficient to 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 claim for loss of property instead of uh, loss of business and avoid uh, uh, using the uh, pricey expert report. So, if you are claiming in respect of lost movable property, which is an uh, often case uh, uh, in, uh, in in uh, given that the occupied uh, parts of Ukraine are eastern parts and. Uh, uh, there were lots of uh, uh, land plots there. So if you are claiming for tractors or other agricultural equipment, you might need to think of uh, 
uh, collecting purchase contracts, state registration documents, uh, and uh, detailed specification of the lost equipment. Uh, in some cases, uh, and uh, we've seen such cases, uh, the equipment uh, has GPS trackers, and that's very helpful because that could even help sometimes to ident identify that uh, um, specific tractor was uh, taken from Ukraine, and then it uh, crossed the border, the official recognized international border, and it was uh, found somewhere. Uh, I mean, it was tracked to some uh, Russian territories and. Uh, even sometimes uh, several hundred kilometers uh, from uh, Ukrainian border. So that could be very helpful. Uh, then evidence from the internet of the approximate price of similar equipment uh, and ideally evidence uh, from the dealer because dealer can be considered as uh, more uh, as a person having more expertise on uh, how much that would cost, uh, how much that cost before the Russian invasion and, and things like that. Uh, then, uh, uh, if you are claiming in respect of stolen grains, uh, which is also uh, a common case uh, in Ukraine, and when I'm saying that, I'm not saying that investment reputations has been already commenced on that, but uh, there were uh, cases when the grain was stolen. Yeah, so that's that's what I'm referring to. So in that case, in those cases, you might need uh, the uh, following uh, documents that. Uh, you can see on the screen, uh, so the purchase contracts and invoices uh, covering the relevant grain uh, as, as a first uh, uh, and most necessary evidence. Then uh, quality and quantity certificates, uh, transport documents or wa warehouse certificates uh, showing the grain was stored at the time when it was stolen. Uh, also, any evidence demonstrating that it has been stolen or, or destroyed. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, best case scenario and uh, uh, I know one case uh, like that is when uh, uh, the grain has been stolen and uh, from a quite new facility. And that facility had uh, a uh, sophisticated uh, security system where they had uh, drones uh, and uh, uh, cameras uh, in and uh, outside the facility. So uh, basically the company had the whole video footage of what was happening and it was even possible to see uh, the uh, emblems uh, on the Russian soldiers, though so it was possible to identify uh, who actually took the grain, uh, which 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 military uh, unit took the grain, uh, and uh, in that way to attribute uh, some, in a way, attribute responsibility, or attempt to attribute responsibility in future. And uh, surely, evidence of market price of the grain would also be very helpful. And uh, last but not least, if uh, uh, you are claiming respect of uh, your rights to use the land, for example, have uh, uh, you have leased agricultural land but uh, could not have used it due to Russia, Russian occupation or uh, any kind of military activities on that particular plot of land. Uh, in that case, you might need to lease agreements uh, in, to find lease agreements and um, any state registration thereof. Uh, Exp any expert assessments of the land you might have uh, con conducted so as to identify the potential crop yield. Uh, if you do not have it, you could organize it with an expert from the agricultural institution. That would be very helpful. Uh, also evidence of the past crop yields and uh, historic evidence of the prices you have sold your crops uh, for and uh, any projections uh, of the expected uh, income from selling the, 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 the crops in the future. Also, evidence of the cost of uh, uh, planting and harvesting the crops, including the cost of equipment, lease or amortization, human resources, fuel, fuel and others, that it has been proven that it would constitute a huge part of the investment. So the next part is managing costs, as this is also a question that is often raised. Before launching an arbitration, it is important to ensure that you have enough money to finish it. And uh, you would need to discuss with the lawyers how much arbitration in your particular case uh, would likely cost, although it's always difficult to uh, assess at the very beginning of the arbitration, but at least some uh, rough assessments uh, could be uh, given. Uh, to begin with, uh, you could always start with the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce official calculator, which provides the pre-assessment of the uh, likely charges, but that calculator does not include the uh, prices for uh, lawyers' fees. 
So that's something separate that you should also take into account. Uh, on a positive side, in case of uh, in case of w the victory in the case, uh, the tribunal will most likely put expenses on the losing side uh, that is on Russia. There are also various instruments to control uh, costs, including finding finding claimants uh, and uh, third party funding. So uh, many investors have suffered similar kinds of losses due to Russia's invasion into of Ukraine, and uh, many cases have uh, uh, similar legal points uh, to uh, argue. As for example, the point of uh, de, facto, de facto control uh, of a certain territory. Uh, if uh, Russia disputes ju jurisdiction of the investment tribunal in different cases, it will also likely use uh, similar arguments. For these reasons, it might uh, make a lot of sense to group similar claims or claims arising from Russia's occupations of the same uh, particular territory or small region uh, and to group them and to run them together. Uh, for example, Mr. Kolomoysky uh, grouped the claims of the various companies uh, owning his patrol stations in the Crimea into the same uh, arbitration. Uh, grouping Claims together is likely to save uh, significant amounts of money for your lawyers and reduce arbitration fees. And therefore, to reduce costs, you should speak to your neighbors, uh, uh, neighbor investors uh, who have lost business in your region and uh, ask them if they are willing to join you in seeking compensation from Russia in the future. As to third party funding, that's another instrument that can be used to manage costs. Uh, to put this simply, uh, there are players on the market who help financing your investment arbitration in, in return for a part uh, of the potentially awarded sum. Mm, the funder will carry out due diligence uh, to gain understanding of the claim, often including an, an independent, getting an independent opinion from a neutral law firm or a senior lawyer uh, with experience in the relevant field. Uh, if all of this uh, due diligence is favorable, then the negotiations will start regarding the uh, sums that can be uh, invested in your uh, or funded uh, in your uh, proceedings. Uh, what the third party funders usually do during the due diligence, uh, they will uh, likely uh, check the claimant at its financial position and uh, res available resources for the investment arbitration. Then a funder will conduct its own assessment of the merits of the potential claim and evidence available, as well as uh, potential defenses and uh, counterclaims by Russia. Uh, a funder will assess the relevant experience and reputation of the claim's proposed legal team, and uh, as well as proposed legal budget and uh, uh, expected amount of potential recovery. This is surely not the only points that will be considered, but these are some the maybe the, the, the main and the first ones to consider. It should also be noted that fewer than 10% of initial approaches to funders result in funding uh, being offered to investors. Uh, investors should also be aware of potential restrictions that a funder may impose as condition of funding the case, including uh, some degree of uh, control of the choice of the counsel and even uh, strategy and tactics of the case. And that will surely depend on the results of the due diligence and whether the funder agrees with a specific strategy suggested by uh, investors' lawyers. Uh, at that, I uh, conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. I will now stop sharing and uh, invite the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Gordon Nalder, King's Counsel from 20 Essex, and uh, he will uh, talk to us about the European Court of Human Rights and, invest, uh, and investor state arbitration and uh, how does the human rights law affect the obligation of arbitral tribunals and national courts. Well, many thanks indeed, uh, and many thanks to the Ukrainian Bar Association for this invitation uh, and solidarity to all those lawyers in Ukraine working in far more challenging circumstances than uh, lawyers like, like Lorraine and myself who are, uh, who, who are uh, inevitably observing the situation from the, from the sidelines and contributing our thoughts as best we can. 
Um, apologies for my momentary disappearance earlier. Um, my uh, system was reporting an intermittent connection. I think I've resolved it, but apologies if um, uh, an intermittent connection reasserts itself during uh, during this session. So uh, in the interest of time, let's move straight on to the first substantive uh, substantive slide. The next slide, please. Let me give you an overview uh, uh, of this topic. Um, as part of the discussion about potential claims uh, against Russia in relation to its uh, unlawful invasion and occupation of Ukrainian territory, that there, there, there has been discussion of various possible routes. And of course, today we're focusing on investor state dispute settlement. Uh, but um, there has been a great deal of interest in the possible direct use of the European Convention on Human Rights. And that was, uh, uh, that was uh, touched on in the chapter one, the October run of this uh, series of seminars. Uh, and um, uh, uh, Alexei Koltok at uh, Senko Karenko dealt with that. And unfortunately, the window for making those claims directly against Russia in the European Court of Human Rights has now effectively closed. The, the sunset uh, period from Russian denunciation of the convention in March 2022 uh, means that the European Court of Human Rights isn't directly examining uh, alleged violations uh, that took place after the 16th of September 2022, and effectively the four-month period for making applications to the Strasbourg Court has now passed. And although those of you who uh, who, who watched that, uh, who, who tuned into that webinar will have spotted this, although theoretically four months doesn't start to run until you've exhausted your domestic remedies, the consensus during that session was also that there are very few effective remedies, certainly none in uh, on Russian territory, that it's realistic to uh, it's realistic to attempt to exhaust. So the window has effectively closed for direct use of the convention. And so what I'm going to deal with is the extent to which arguments based on the European Convention on Human Rights and other principles of international human rights law can play in cases brought under bilateral and multilateral investment treaties within the arbitral proceedings themselves, and possibly of greater interest in attempts to enforce arbitral awards against Russian assets held in third states. So I'm going to deal briefly with those two topics, very briefly indeed, with the question of how human rights law plays within investor state dispute settlement proceedings themselves, and then spend a lion's share of uh, the, the, the time that's, uh, that's left to me uh, on um, uh, human rights and enforcement, and in particular, on this question of whether human rights principles uh, can move the boundaries of state immunity from execution. I, it, it's, it's implicit in everything that, um, that's just been said, particularly by Vladislav, that um, uh, what, what one, of the, one of the key areas of interest is going to be not just whether you win an ISDS claim against Russia, do you have the requisite evidence, do you have sources of funding and so on, but can you collect on an award? And that's probably going to be question one that any funder will ask, you know, have you identified assets against which you can enforce an award? Um, and so the question is going to be, how do international and national courts resolve the tension, resolve the contest between two high value conflicting principles of international law? On the one hand, sovereign immunity of a state and specifically its property. And on the other hand, the jurisdictional protection of victims of violation of, of human rights. And so the base question I'm going to ask in relation to that last bullet point is effectively this, can the usual rules in international law of sovereign immunity of assets be disapplied or at least modified on the basis of human rights arguments? So for example, where the breach of an investment treaty also involves some violation of human rights norms or other important principles of international law, in other words, something over and above what might be called an ordinary breach of an investment treaty, or for example, can human rights arguments come into play in the context of enforcement, where it can be shown that the assets which it's sought to execute against are in some way themselves connected with abuses of international law or human rights standards. And what I'm going to be looking at is what the decided cases so far in the European, European space tell us, bearing in mind that the facts of those cases are mostly very different from international aggression. As we'll see, some of the cases I'm going to look at are a little closer than others to the situation in Ukraine, but most of the cases deal with very different issues. So to some extent, this is going to be uh, rather speculative, 
a bit of blue sky thinking, but nevertheless, I hope a meaningful exercise in examining what's happened where human rights arguments have been used in an attempt to invoke the jurisdiction of national courts or disapply sovereign immunity of assets from enforcement. How might that play in the context of ISDS awards in favour of uh, investors uh, who have uh, uh, obtained awards, obtained awards of damages in relation to Russian aggression? Um, so first of all, ne next slide, um, this question of how human rights play within investor state arbitration um, uh, 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 itself. Well, first of all, there, uh, any practitioner in this area will bemoan the fact that historically um, investor state arbitration has been very fragmented in terms of the principles that are applied. In the absence of a single international instrument administered by a single uh, judicial body, uh, the answer to particular questions of interpretation has historically depended partly on the wording of international treaties, each individual bit, and partly on the approach taken by each uh, individual, uh, each individual uh, tribunal. Um, and so fragmentation has been the order of the day, and that can make the results of claims for expropriation or breach of, say, the fair and equitable treatment uh, standard rather unpredictable. Human rights law undoubtedly has a role to play here in making the process a little less unpredictable. It's been quite interesting to see over the years how tribunals have begun to apply when looking at whether there's been a breach of an individual bilateral investment treaty, have begun to apply standards of human rights law recognized more universally. Um, and I've mentioned a couple of cases, TechMed in Mexico and PL Holdings in Poland, where to one extent or another, the tribunal has uh, applied principles derived from international human rights laws, specifically from the approach of the European Court of Human Rights to claims made under Article 1 of the first protocol to the European Convention, which is the protection of property provision. Uh, so in the TechMed case, um, which is a case brought under the Spain-Mexico uh, Bilateral Investment Treaty, the tribunal expressly formulated uh, the, the test for determining whether there was a breach of the treaty uh, in terms of the, the famous James and other case in the European Court of Human Rights, asking itself, among other things, whether the investor had been made to bear an individual and excessive burden. Now, just pausing there, those of you who are familiar with the approach of the European Court of Human Rights will know that when that court is asking whether an interference with property has been excessive, it will allow the, the, the member state what in many cases is a very generous margin of appreciation. In other words, there's a principle of subsidiarity of European supervision. The European court will only intervene where the, where the domestic authorities, including the domestic courts, have overstepped the mark in striking the balance between individual rights and countervailing interests for themselves. And there is an indication that where investor state dispute settlement tribunals are applying these principles, they take a rather more hands-on approach than the European Court of Human Rights. In other words, the test is not just has the state itself properly struck the balance between individual rights and the general interest, but do we, the tribunal, think the balance should have been struck in that way? So there's rather a less consistent margin of appreciation. And, that, and that's evident from, from this more recent case, PL Holdings in Poland. Now, it's fair to say that although there was an award in that case, they, the, the award has now been caught up in the post-ACMIR uh, intra-EU jurisdictional bar shenanigans. Uh, but nevertheless, the principle was there, a, a, rather, uh, a, a rather more interventionist approach uh, when applying uh, uh, European uh, human rights principles than perhaps from the European court itself. Uh, so um, uh, in, in general terms, some advance uh, for investors through tribunal's application of human rights standards. But you have to be careful what you wish for. There, there is some evidence, for example, that human, that human rights arguments have rather rebounded on investors in some cases, not least because human rights arguments have fueled state defenses and in some cases even counterclaims against investor and against investors for alleged breach of, breaches of their own ob ob obligations. And I mentioned the uh, Bassa and Argentina case. So moving on to the next slide and getting on, on to the, uh, the meat of what I wanted to devote uh, my time today to, and that is how human rights arguments play in relation to enforcement of awards of compensation made in ISDS proceedings. Well, the starting point is this. There's a general principle which began life as a principle of customary international law, but has since been codified in the 
UN um, state immunity convention and, and, and various related instruments, a general principle of state immunity from the jurisdiction of foreign and international bodies and immunity of state assets from uh, execution. And in the context of investor state dispute settlements, it's rather complicated by the fact that the state inevitably submits to a ju jurisdictional bodies in the first place. So the state inevitably submits to the jurisdiction of the arbitral mechanism in each treaty. It's also likely to, to have submitted to an international enforcement mechanism of one sort or another, either the New York Convention uh, in the case of uh, SCC or uh, uh, UNCITRAL uh, arbitration, or, uh, uh, the, the, uh, or, or the ICSID uh, system in the case of those states who've ratified the Washington Convention. Now, of course, Russia has ratified the New York Convention. It's a signatory to, uh, but not a contracting party to, uh, the ICSID Convention, although some bilateral investment treaties may allow the use, and indeed have allowed the use, of the ICSID additional facility rules. But the important point is that even where a state has submitted to the jurisdiction of an international adjudication mechanism and the jurisdiction of an international enforcement mechanism such as the New York Convention, that doesn't of itself imply a further waiver of immunity of sovereign assets from execution. Indeed, there's a specific express provision in the ICSID Convention to that effect. Uh, um, so how can human rights principles um, come into play? Um, well, the argument is effectively this, and I foreshadowed it earlier. Um, inevitably, there's a balance to be struck between important principles of international law. For sure, the principle of sovereign immunity of assets against enforcement is an important one. Um, but uh, how does the, the important principle of jurisdictional protection, effective jurisdictional protection of human rights, play against that? Um, can the boundaries of state immunity against enforcement against assets be, be modified or, or disapplied by reference to, to human rights arguments at an international and a state level. Well, let's look first of all at how those arguments have played at an international level, uh, starting with the European Court of Human Rights, which begins on the next slide. So great, thanks. So the European Court of Human Rights ha has had to look at arguments against state immunity, human rights arguments against state immunity on the number of occasions. The uh, earliest detailed consideration of this issue I, I found was in the Alatsani and the UK case. Um, the facts were these. There was an allegation of a fairly serious breach uh, on any view of international human rights standards, alleged torture um, for which the uh, 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 for, for which the Kuwaiti uh, uh, state um, was uh, alleged to be responsible. And the, the individual victim brought civil proceedings in England for damages against the official uh, responsible for the torture and the Kuwaiti state itself. And the English Court of Appeal dismissed the claim on the basis of sovereign immunity under the UK State Immunity Act 1978. And uh, the, uh, the court noted uh, the familiar um, territorial tort exception to sovereign immunity, but said that where torture has taken place outside uh, UK territory, there's no equivalent exception, so no torture exception, even though on any view, the protection uh, of individuals against torture and similar physical abuse must be a very high value principle of international law. That didn't itself justify creating an exception under UK implementation of international law on state immunity. And off went the case to the European Court of Human Rights. Complaints were made under Articles 3 of the Convention, that's the protection against uh, torture and inhuman and degrading treatment and punishment, and also under Articles 6 and 13. Article 6 um, is, is uh, the right of access to court to bring a civil claim. Article 3 is the right to an effective remedy. And the court found all those complaints admissible but dismiss them on the merits. And what's interesting is what the court said about Article 6. The court accepted that there was a growing uh, uh, international consensus censoring torture and also recognised that there had been at least some limited movement uh, in international and national thinking on the extent of state immunity, especially in relation to criminal liability. There was a growing trend towards extraterritorial enforcement uh, of criminal liability against state uh, actors. And the court specifically acknowledged the arguments made in the International Law Commission's 1999 report on jurisdictional immunities, especially its recognition that prohibition of torture had become a, a norm of jus cogens at the very highest, the apex level of norms of international law. But nevertheless, it found that it was that there was not yet acceptance in international law of loss of immunity for civil claims for torture 
committed outside the foreign state. So rather an orthodox position, although recognizing that perhaps in due time the position might change. So next slide, please. So scrolling forward from 2001, to uh, 2009, so uh, the court recognizing in 2001 things might move on, but apparently by 2009 they hadn't moved on that far. This was the, the Zedelmeyer Germany case. This is perhaps a little closer to home because it, uh, it, it was a case all about enforcement of arbitral awards under a bilateral investment treaty uh, to which Russia was a party and the facts concerned a, 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 a US dollar, uh, $235 million award against Russia under the Germany Soviet Union bit, and the creditor sought to enforce that against a variety of assets belonging to Russia but held in Germany, and two assets in particular. First of all, a VAT reimbursement claims in relation to um, services rendered to the Russian embassy, and air traffic, fee, tra traffic fees owed to Russia by the German flag carrier Lufthansa. And the, the German federal court, the Bundesgerichtshof, refused execution. Uh, and in particular, what it held in relation to the VAT reimbursement claims is that it couldn't go behind the Russian state's assertion that the VAT claims related to the maintenance of sovereign functions of Russia's diplomatic missions in Germany. Although the, uh, although the judge, the award creditor, argued that that claim should be interrogated and properly investigated on the facts by the uh, by the uh, a, a German court, the German court said no, because an essential element of state immunity is that the, the, the one state cannot investigate in its courts uh, matters in respect of which the other state can claim sovereign immunity. The European Court of Human Rights ruled a complaint under Article 1 of the First Protocol, the protection of the property provision, inadmissible. Um, it argued, um, in, it accepted the creditor's argument that the non-enforcement of an award was in principle an interference with peaceful enjoyment of possessions. It confirmed its own judgment in the well-known Strand Greek case. But when it comes to striking a fair balance between the rights of the award creditor and countervailing public interests, the court held that international rules on sovereign immunity serve a legitimate purpose. And more importantly, these rules strike a fair balance. And that fair balance wasn't upset by the refusal of the German courts to investigate the facts to determine whether the, uh, the uh, uh, Russian state's assertion uh, of sovereign immunity was made out on the facts. So, uh, so, so, so much for the European Court of Human Rights. What about what's been happening at national level? So next slide, please. So some movement, and I'm looking here at the European space, I think what's taken place in the United States is very interesting, but to some extent a bit of an outline. So looking at things in the European space, well, in Italy, those of you who tuned in to the second run, uh, edition two of this series, will have seen some uh, discussion uh, by uh, 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 of the decision of the uh, Italian Constitutional Court in its judgment 238-2014, um, which concerned the implementation in, uh, in Italian law of a previous ruling of the International Court of Justice in Germany and Italy, where the International Court of Justice took very much the, the, the same view as the, the domestic court and the European Court of Human Rights did uh, in, in the Alad Sani case. Um, no, no exception to state immunity, even for the most heinous um, international misconduct and, and, and international, uh, international criminal activity. The Italian Constitutional Court, affirming its earlier jurisprudence, said no, where, uh, the, the, where the state claims immunity to protect itself from some of the most uh, heinous and, and criminal international acts, that immunity is forfeited. And now that issue is going back to the, uh, the, the ICJ. So that's very much at one end of the scale. Um, today's audience will be familiar with uh, what's taking place in Ukraine, but perhaps on a slightly, slightly more subtle constitutional basis than the Italian Constitutional Court where the U Ukraine Supreme Court has said, among other things, that Article 6.1 of the ECHR and the territorial tort exception under uh, the, the UN Immunity Convention um, can protect claims arising out of unlawful Russian actions uh, in Crimea uh, uh, and elsewhere, going back to 2014. So similar result to the Italian court, but on a rather more measured basis. That brings me to the UK Supreme Court. And in some ways, this is, this is rather more the pit canary of how these arguments play, because the, 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 the United Kingdom courts have tended to be rather orthodox and conservative in their approach, as we saw from the decision of the uh, Court of Appeal 
in the al Sani case. So these two cases are rather interesting because in both cases, um, the a priori rather, rather orthodox UK Supreme Court bench was prepared to make at least some modification to the traditional approach to state immunity in order to give way to human rights arguments. So let me just say a, 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 a word or two very quickly about uh, these two cases. First of all, the Benkabush case, this was about the, the, the effect of UK legislation, which barred an employment claim by a member of embassy staff, where it would not have barred an equivalent commercial claim by an independent contractor. And the, the Supreme Court held that that was a violation of, of the right of access to court under Article 6 of the ECHR because it was discriminatory in its effect and also took the view that, in fact, that the, 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 the State Immunity Act in the UK didn't properly implement a public international law on, on its true understanding. And it's fair to say that the, the European Court of Human Rights uh, itself, in a, in a case involving um, a, a, a Lithuanian embassy staff in Poland, took much the same view in, 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 a, in a 2009 case. Um, but that's really a very minor adjustment to the boundaries. More interesting is this more recent case decided just last year in Basfar and, and, and Wong. And this was a case uh, where Mr. Basfar, who was a Saudi diplomat, had employed Ms. Wong, but had employed her in, in, on very unorthodox terms, which amounted effectively to forced labour, to modern slavery. And the question was whether that fell within the commercial activity exception uh, to state to to a diplomatic uh, immunity, um, and the UK Supreme Court, by a majority of three to two, held that um, employing staff in circumstances that amounted to forced labour or modern slavery in violation of emerging norms of international law could not be regarded as an ordinary activity incidental to the day-to-day -day duties of a member of diplomatic staff, and therefore it fell within the commercial activity exemption. That's rather interesting, not least because the minority in the Supreme Court took the very orthodox view that this was a serious breach of principles, well-established principles of sovereign immunity might expose diplomats elsewhere to retaliation and so on. So it's a very useful indication of um, a jurisdiction which tends to be rather conservative and orthodox, nevertheless accepting that there's some movement of the dial. So the final slide, just posing the question, where, where, where does all this leave us? And just, just picking this up in, uh, in, in just very briefly indeed in 30 seconds or so. So last slide, please. It seems to me that there is at least some evidence of growing recognition, at least at national level, of some limits in principle on state immunity in the face of countervailing human rights considerations. It's going to take very considerable efforts indeed, and probably I think a change of heart uh, uh, um, uh, um, among um, people with very settled opinions among the national and international judiciary before there's any wholesale uh, modification of state immunity against execution of assets. But nevertheless, um, at least there does seem some willingness in, uh, in national courts to do what the European Court of Human Rights was not prepared to do. Uh, we said that national courts weren't obliged to do in the, uh, in, 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 in the cases we looked at, which is interrogate and go behind the factual basis of claims made um, for state immunity. I think if nothing else emerges from this series of cases, I think we're going to see rather more interest on the part of national courts uh, in, in going behind bare assertions by debtor states as to the purposes for which assets are held. So limited good news for creditors, but a long way to go. So many thanks indeed. Yep. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you very much. At this, this is basically all that we want to discuss today. Uh, what we have is a questions and us and answers uh, section. Uh, at the same time, I, I urge everyone to ask questions. Uh, maybe somebody from the panel has questions to each other. Okay, in that case, we don't have any questions in the chat today. And uh, uh, since we don't have any questions from the panel, 
Uh, I suggest that we close today's meeting. Uh, we've made it with just 11 minutes uh, post our uh, scheduled time, which is very nice for a group of lawyers uh, who always like to talk. Uh, I think that this meeting was uh, rather productive and uh, I've uh, personally learned a lot from uh, my colleagues. I hope that everyone uh, uh, gets something new for them. And uh, then thank you very much. And uh, we are looking forward to our next chapter, chapter number four, which will be dedicated to uh, claims commissions uh, and other uh, procedures and instruments that can be used or could be used in future to collect damages uh, from uh, Russia. Uh, thank you everyone and uh, uh, have a nice evening. See you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank <laughs> you, very everyone. It's provoke and discussion. Very helpful. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be a part of this panel, and I would love to spend another two hours with you. But <laughs> but let's go. Thank you very much. Thank. You. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. bye.